All right, so how are we doing this morning? Like afternoon for our East Coast guys. Um, before I uh, start here, I just wanted to, can we turn that down just a little bit? Is that possible? Sorry. Um, just wanted to preface that if you go to any conference, uh, the big thing right now is wearable technology. And um, there's a lot of noise out there. And I mean, even present here, we've got a lot of different uh, uh, wearable technology uh, available to look at and see. And I don't think there's one distinct uh, service or one distinct product that's going to take care of everything. And the biggest thing when you're going through this or looking to implement it with uh, your program or your sport is being able to say, okay, if I'm collecting data, it needs to really influence what I do and have an effect on the decisions that I'm making. Because if it's not, you're really going to be spending a lot of time and, <laughs> and a lot of work for, for really nothing if you're not getting anything out of it. So that's something just to keep in the back of your mind uh, as we go through all of this. So I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, my uh, graduate assistant, Eric Grosinger, for his contributions to this as well um, in assisting and putting this together. But uh, utilization of heart rate and GPS data for on and, ice, off, on and off ice uh, programming. So I'm going to start us off here with a little video. And what I want you to think about with this video is the first car that you see, think about them as athletes, okay? At the time, they were the best, okay, for their time period. Um, and just uh, really think about them in terms of how we talk to our athletes about uh, preparing their bodies. So we're looking at a Formula One pit stop here, okay, in 1950, Indianapolis 500. And this car right here, that's the, uh, that's the best of that day. Okay, we have to remember that, the best of that day. So look at the guy at the top, just hammering away at that tire. They're getting it, they're getting it, okay? We've got guys climbing on top of the cars. Guys here pumping gas. Still hammering away at that tire. Determined though, good for him. Got everyone just blowing through. He needs a drink of water, that's really good. We've got uh, some guy's going to come squeegee his windshield here in a second. Make sure that everything's looked after. Give the wheels a couple turns. Make sure they're still working right. Yeah, they see there he is. All oh, this, he needed two guys to do that. We didn't do it well enough the first time. Hammering away at the second tire, pulling it on here. We're at about 40 seconds here for our pit stop. Still working, still working. We've got two guys determining what here, what else we need to do. You see, that's the. Uh, He's still going on that windshield. So, 67 seconds. And they were like, wow, that was awesome. They did a great job. That car went on to win that, by the way. Now 2013 in Melbourne. Okay, so again, now think of this as our athlete today. Okay, a little bit more high tech, a little bit more high power. Okay, we've got our, uh, our pit crew here, obviously advancing in a little bit of the technology that we're utilizing. And uh, they come in and they're ready. Everyone knows their role, what we're looking at. Everyone has their piece of technology they're responsible for. He gets in. You good to go? You need water? No, I'm good, thanks. I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. So this is the biggest thing is if we're thinking of these as our athletes, we need to continually think about how we're doing things with them and how we can do what we do better. Okay. So what are we going to get out of this? Why do we use it? Why is it important? Technology. Well, in today's day and age, it's kind of the way we're going. Okay? What's the purpose of it within a team setting? The differences between our positions. Okay? Obviously, we know there's differences in positions. Uh, Coach Mountain's going to really give us a good look into uh, goaltenders here in a little bit. Um, what's enough? What's too much? and what prepares each player. So not only looking at now the differences within the positions, but the differences within the players within the positions. Are they a first line guy? Are they a fourth line guy? Are they a in and out of the lineup kind of guy? How to apply the data, okay? How do we apply it to what we do on a daily basis? How do we communicate that data effectively to our coaching staff and to our players? Because if we don't have the buy-in from our coaching staff or our players, again, everything we're gonna be doing is gonna be for naught. So again, why we use it? Well, it's quantifiable. As coaches, we always want numbers. We love numbers. We love to be able to measure things. We love to be able to test things. We love to be able to re-evaluate what we're doing. 
really kind of validate what's going on. It creates that individuality, okay? Like I spoke about, the differences in positions, the differences uh, in, uh, in, in line combinations. That ability to change and predict intensity of days more accurately. So how do we better prepare our athletes in the college setting for a Friday and Saturday night? How do we better prepare them for our Saturday night game after our Friday night game? What happened on Friday that we need to account for on Saturday? What accounted throughout the week that maybe worked or didn't work that we can now reevaluate and go forward? And then again, it assists us in our planning. Okay, when we're sitting down with our coaching staff, we actually have something to come to the table with and say, hey, you know what, maybe we should do this differently or maybe we should do that differently. And he says, well, why should we do that? Give me some evidence as to why. Well, here, let's walk through the numbers. Let's take a look at what we can do better. And then being able to apply that to video and uh, like uh, I'll show you here in a little bit, give them a little bit more insight as to why we're doing things to help them buy in a little bit more. So the purpose within the team setting, again, it allows individual programming while maintaining that team mentality. And that team mentality, really at the college setting, and Coach Skian will talk a little bit about it tomorrow, the difference between the pros and that college level, is there's a huge, huge focus on, we gotta do everything as a team, we gotta crush them, we gotta build that mental toughness, we gotta go, 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 go. Well, we're allowed, to, we're able now to see the effects of certain things that we do on our players and really kind of tweak things within that team mentality setting. Identifies, again, different positional needs, which we've talked about. Creates trust and buy-in with coaches and players. With that trust becomes accountability. And then programming for different venues. Um, within our league, we have a couple Olympic ice sheets. We have a couple NHL ice sheets. Believe it or not, the game is completely different when we play on those two. We have to get the guys ready for that, and we have to change the way we train over the course of the week going into the weekend. So taking a look at our positional differences here, okay? Just ironically, again, I've chose a Pittsburgh alum and a San Jose alum. Figures they're in the Stanley Cup final. If I was that good at predicting, my uh, bracket would have been a lot better than it is. Uh, so our goaltenders, okay? They're the only player to play 60 minutes. Only guy, okay? Obviously, uh, much more aerobic than, uh, than other positions, but requires that uh, repetitive burst uh, of, of movements, okay? Small area, that's really all we're covering. Uh, we're asking them to be in much more uh, extreme positions, uh, which uh, Coach Shaw just spoke about. Um, pre and post game lactate differential of all the positions is much different. Um, highest body fat, lowest anaerobic capacity, uh, lowest anaerobic power, lowest VO2 max, but it's very technical. So the very bottom portion there, very technical. That's something that we have to take into account when we're practicing. You take a look at a practice from a typical, uh, from a typical team, the goalies are getting shots after shots after shots after shots. It's just really warm up, okay? And you take a look at a heart rate curve, and these guys are absolutely getting smoked, smoked. And your goalie coach is on the side going, man, Guy never finishes a save. Guy never finishes out a rebound. Guy's mentally weak. Garbage. Look at that weak goalie let in. Shot 48 in the last two minutes. So that's something that, again, we can bring to our coaches and say, how can we train our goalies more specific to what they're actually doing in a game? So we're going to take a look here. And uh, if we take a look at this heart rate curve right through here, okay, this is about a 48 second span. The guys will come in and out of the zone three times, okay? This is us happening to play Colorado College. Again, ironic, didn't do that on purpose. But take a look at our goaltender, and the amount of movement done is not a lot. But the strain is pretty high. We're looking at maintaining heart rate zone between 80 and about 87%. We get over into this eight minute span, okay? We're going up and down. This is a TV timeout here. This is a TV timeout here. But again, we're really in that 70 to 85% range for a much greater period of time than we will be when we see what we're doing with other players. So you're going to see we're going to enter the zone. And by about the red line, our goal start, goalies are starting to get ready. Okay, So he's at the top, shuffling across. He's down. He's making a save. He's getting back up. Make another save, okay? In position, a little scrambly. 
Doesn't clear the zone, so again, we're not in a fully relaxed state yet, obviously. You still gotta be ready for anything that's gonna happen. He's on, okay, first clear the zone. Back on his post, probably gearing up to get back out. Okay, let's rim around. Again, he's on, he's having to be ready to go. You look at the difference, again, obviously he's not skating in a vast difference uh, amount of positions, but requiring still a high amount of work. Okay, the puck's now coming back in again. Got a little reprieve. And so we see that reprieve as, he was, as the puck came down. That was the poke check as we came up. As we clear the zone, we spend some time in their end on this time. We drop back down. So again, over that course of time, we're, we're not really hitting a high peak, but it's that moderate workload that we're asking them to do continually. Okay, we look at our forwards here. Okay, our top two line forwards play upwards of 20 to 22 minutes in a game. Okay, average shift length of about 43 seconds, and this is numbers from us. Okay, anywhere from 17 to 27 shifts per game. Again, depending if you're a first line guy, fourth line guy, you play power play, you're a PK. Uh, depending on the type of game it is, do we need to push the first and second lines a little bit more? Are we in control of the game? Are we kind of rolling four? Again, a lot of different variables. Time above 90, okay? Same as shift number. And then, uh, so we're looking at about uh, 17 to 27 minutes, depending on what we're looking at. They cover more distance than any other, uh, any other position. Obviously, that should be known. We're going the entire length of the, uh, of the ice, which we'll see here uh, in a moment. Higher anaerobic demands than a defenseman, but they typically have a higher VO2 max and anaerobic power uh, output. Highest acceleration numbers per shift. Again, I'll kind of get into that in a second. But basically what that we're looking at there is the high force production that is created uh, in every shift by every player. And then uh, skill players versus power forwards will have significantly different data. Okay, are you a skill forward? You're kind of floating around a little bit more. You're not really digging in the corners. You're not creating as much body contact. You're not involved in as much of the game, but all of a sudden that puck's on your stick. It's got a shot to go to the back of the net have to be able to train them differently. We have to know these things. Because all of a sudden, if we're training our skill guys, getting pounded, getting pounded, getting pounded, well, there's a higher risk of injury. If we're not training our power guys to be able to do that repetitively, well, all of a sudden, come late second, third periods, overtimes, we're not gonna be able to repeat that. So let's take a look at number nine here. Number nine is at the circle right now. And, uh, He's now on a back check, so okay, he's out, he was in the corner, he's in the far corner, he's now skating back. Okay, he took about five hard strides to get out of the zone, kind of gliding, kind of figuring it out. He's gonna go deep, engage in a little battle. Now he's gonna get on his horse, he's gonna come down hard. He's, he's eventually gonna be the guy that takes the shot. Okay, takes a deep shot, now he's deep in the zone again. So now this is his third trip back. You get him, see he's on his horse, he's the first guy back, he's picking up the trailer, finding his man. Engage in another little battle in the corner. He's going to be the guy that ends up clearing the puck. Dumps it in, and he goes for a change. So we take a look here. We peak much higher, obviously, than our goaltender. Okay, our goaltender is only coming up to about 85%. Again, that's very obvious in duration. Only 36 seconds. That's all that shift was, but very high intensity, okay, very high intensity. Back and forth about three and a half times, engaged in about two or three different battles, took a shot, blocked a shot, okay. There was a lot of things going on there, and all things we have to train him for and allow him to do over 17 to 27 times in a game. We take a look at our defensemen, okay. A top defensive pairing plays upwards of 30 minutes a game. Again, an average shift length of about 47 seconds. Okay, a little higher. Okay, and we'll find out why in a second. Anywhere from 23 to 32 shifts in a game. Okay, so again, we're requiring them to be out there a little bit longer. Okay, we're requiring to be, them to be out there a little bit more. And with that, we're not gonna be working at quite the intensity all the time. Okay, again, they don't cover as much distance. Typically, they'll only go from blue line to goal line. Okay, sometimes we might get on a rush. But quite often, if you see a D-man go on a rush, First opportunity to get off, it's usually happening. Time above 90%, okay, a quarter of the number of shifts. 
for example, okay, if there's 20 shifts, five minutes above 90 versus a one-to-one -one ratio typically for our forwards. So again, taking a look at that difference of output. Time above 80%, however, okay, big difference here. Upwards of 35 minutes a game. Well, Justin, you're telling me he only plays 30 minutes typically. So that recovery period, when he's getting back on the bench, takes a little bit sometimes, okay? There's gonna be a lot of that kind of goaltender range a little bit, but again, the peaks and valleys are gonna happen. Intensity duration less, higher work to rest ratios. Obviously, if we're running four lines, we only have three D pairings. Anaerobic power, anaerobic uh, power output. Less than forwards, but greater than goaltenders. Fewer high power uh, accelerations than our forwards. And again, we're gonna see why here in a moment. We're gonna take a look at uh, D-man number 55. He's gonna be up on the blue line in the uh, bottom corner right here, okay? So D-man 55 is gonna come into your screen right here. He just came off from a change. Okay, so we started down low. He got out, spiked up high. He's now coming back, tracking, tracking. He's now down low. Again, a couple hard strides, not really anything to kind of write home about. Gets to the blue line, finds his home. Sits there, again, kind of waits, reads the play, identifies some development. We're always moving, feet are always moving, okay? Small motions, but again, not quite hitting the, uh, the peak powers and that high back check that we see. We could even take a look at 96 down low, kind of battling, uh, uh, one-on-one -on -one battling the corner, puck control. Again, very different, okay, very different. So kind of just crested above 90. Now we'll come back down. Next shift we take a look at, doesn't even get to 90, okay? So again, varies based on what we're really looking at. So now I think we understand that we need to train our athletes better, why? Because they are under different requirements in a game. So now let's look at the differences between games and practices. So this highlighted games. Take a look at the heart rate curves here. This right here being warm-ups, first, second, and third period. This pre-game warm-up, okay? Off-ice, little pre-game warm-up, off-ice, little pre-game warm-up. Uh, On-ice warm-up, first, second, third. On-ice, first, second, third. Who can tell me what heart rate curve is for whom? Taking a look at the zoning patterns on the left-hand columns at the top. Anybody? Yep? Forward, D, goaltenders. Forward, D, goaltenders? Forwards, D, goaltenders, perfect, okay? Well, now let's take a look at our practices, okay? So here, <laughs> let's assume this is practices, okay? Mix them up a little bit for you, mix them up a little bit for you. Who do we think is which? A little bit of confusion here, eh? Anybody wanna take a stab? Coach B, we got coach. Or we got goalies, and then who? Forwards D. Forwards D. We got goalies, D men, forwards. Okay? If we take a look at this, it's actually not too bad. I work really closely with our goaltender coach, okay? Knowing what we should look at from a curve standpoint, this is our focused goaltender work before practice. So we get out and we're able to make sure that we are getting the loading patterns that we need. We're making sure that we are getting the adaptations that we need so that when we get to the first 10 minutes of practice, which coach says we need to do this, we need to get the guys going, okay, you know what? You're gonna see a little bit of spike, you know what? Kid, battle through. We got a lot of our work done, you can handle it. Again, in college, different than a pro setting, you have three goalies, sometimes four versus two. Okay, so you have to handle that differently as well. Then all of a sudden we get into, pra uh, into practice a little bit and it gets a little bit better, okay? Our forwards, again, not too bad. We're cresting into 90. We're not in 90 near enough, not even close. Uh, sorry, our D-man. We're getting into 90 a little bit, but again, we could be in upwards of, uh, of 90 a little bit more. And then our forwards, this actually is a pretty good day, okay? High in the 90 zone, recovering back down, allowing for that time in between. But now let's look at practice with poor adaptation over the long term, okay? Well, that goaltender curve certainly does not look like our games or our good practices for that matter. So we look at that and we're like, wow, that actually looks more like a forward. And our defenseman 
If I asked that, if we did that over the course of the week and asked him to play on Friday, he might actually be okay for the first period, but come the second and third, I wouldn't want him handling the puck much in my zone. And our forwards, I mean, I don't even think this guy knows what it's like to hit 90. So I really wouldn't be too comfortable with that. When I first got to, uh, to Miami, this was kind of what practices looked like once or twice a week. And we talked about it. We kind of showed him the numbers. We gave him reasons why. And we actually engaged in a lot of really good conversation. And from really good conversation became changes in philosophies. From changes in philosophies came different habits. From different habits came different outcomes. So what are we looking at here? So external loading. Okay, so the load and stress placed on the body from a muscular, soft tissue, bone, and kinematic standpoint that will lead to peripheral fatigue and decrease in performance and injury risk. So we're looking at number of sprints, percent of time and speed zones, distance covered, starts and stops, and then body contacts. You're able to look at this through a number of different things. And we can, again, break them down into different varieties, which I'll show you in a second. Versus our internal loading, okay? The load's placed on the body from a metabolic, cardiovascular, nervous system standpoint that will lead to central fatigue and cause a decrease in performance and injury risk. Now, these aren't two separate entities, okay? They're blunt this is one, obviously like a sliding spectrum, just like anything. Obviously, there's going to be more metabolic recovery. Uh, the, another one, percent of time zone, okay, above threshold, heart rate recovery, CNS recovery, and our overall fitness level. They're going to be, again, whatever we're focusing on, there's going to be different aspects that we really have to uh, dive in and look at a little bit closer. Over the course of the year, our red line, okay, is our acute, where our black line is our chronic. And again, we've seen a lot of graphs like this before, but this is how we can track it over the course of the year and say, okay, if we're creating separation between these two lines, we have to adjust what we're doing. We have to really take, go back to the drawing board and figure out for each individual. So if I was to change, click on each one of these guys' names, different graphs would pop up, and they should all look something like this, while still creating that individual aspect. Because we're training certain guys more, we're training certain guys less, we're doing uh, certain things with certain guys, well, we're not doing them with other guys. But we still need to make sure that the adaptation that's occurring with each, in each individual looks something like this, because we don't want to overtrain them, we don't want to undertrain them. And then this is over the course of the week, okay? So G1, G2, obviously game one, game two. And then we work on a day minus system, okay? So we're looking at, uh, this is a Sunday. We had one Sunday game, which kind of threw some stuff off just in terms of how this looks. Typically, that's a complete off day. Um, but we're looking at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, okay? The curve should look something like that, okay? Our first, our game one, game two, obviously super high loads. Come game day, the biggest thing our coach was like, well, come day and game, I don't want to like, mess with anything. And I said, you know what? Hockey is a volatile sport. <laughs> you really can't control anything is what you learn. But we can control how we prepare for Friday, Saturday. If we can control how we prepare for Friday, Saturday, we have a lot more confidence going in that we'll be ready for any volatility that occurs. So we just basically let them go. We have a plan going in, obviously, but no holds bar. Sunday, we got them off. Monday, based upon our loading parameters from the weekend, we're sometimes not even recovered come practice time. So we'll take a skill day. Skill day used to be Wednesday, moved it to Monday. Why? We're able to focus on a little bit th things a little bit more uh, acutely, not place as much load on the guys. Start with that skill day, then we move into a little bit of our flow stuff, a little bit of our uh, teaching day systems. Tuesday is our big battle day. Okay, boys have to bring their work boots that day. A lot of in-corner battles, all one-on-ones, two-on-twos, uh, full ice, getting up and down the ice, okay? End with a little skate. Wednesday and Thursday, we're kind of tapering into the weekend. And then Friday, we bring guys out individually in groups of five for our morning skate when we're at home, when we're on the road a little different. But when we're at home, we focus again on those individual needs, what certain guys will do. Once we hit a certain loading number for each guy, that's it, you're done. Okay, you want it? Yeah. Uh, at home or away? It's a little bit different. So on home, we'll, at home we'll bring, uh, we've got three coaches out on the ice, uh, and we'll have uh, basically individual skill stuff that we're working on. So we'll bring typically them out in line combinations, so our 
first line, second line, third guy, fourth line for the night will typically all come together. Our healthy scratches will come uh, at the end and kind of be put through their paces a little bit more. Um, but again, focusing on uh, certain skill parameters and then focusing on uh, some type of attack to the net, some type of shooting, get them kind of used to the feel of the puck again, just kind of feeling good. But our morning skates, again, depending on who you are and what your loading parameter is going to be, it's really no longer than about 10 to 15 minutes. And then um, on Saturdays, depending on how the load was from Friday, who we're playing, where we're at, uh, sometimes we won't even skate. Uh, we'll go into a yoga session, we'll go into a, a little dynamic recovery, we'll go into um, uh, we'll let the guys sleep in, depending on time changes, uh, and then uh, uh, produce a little bit of stress on the body from a different aspect. And again, that all has to do with, uh, with the data we look at. So this is how we program throughout the week. And again, talking with our coach, we're basically able to go, okay, we know that our forwards are different than our D-men. We know that our D-men are different than our goaltenders. We know their goaltenders are completely different than the other two positions. So how do we now account for that? Well, this is what we'll look at. Okay, so we break our weeks, or our days, into green, yellow, and red. Green being obviously our lightest in terms of intensity, yellow, moderate, and red being high. And how we portray that to the players, because he goes, well, I don't want to, make, I don't want to say it's a light day because guys will just come and kind of go through the motions. Not at all. Green day, we're still getting after it. We take a look at our different progressions here. Okay, so we'll look at our daily. Okay, training load number. Again, an arbitrary number basically put through an algorithm that we have that's just a quantifiable number based off accelerations, based off uh, time in certain zones, uh, based off uh, speed zones, based off heart rate recovery times, stuff like that. Volume, okay, that's what we control, okay, that's time, okay, total time of what practice is, and then percent above 90, okay, so if we're practicing for 45 minutes, we need to be at less than 10% above 90, so that would be less than four and a half minutes, okay. If we accomplish those, we've done a green day across the board, and this is where the art of it kind of comes in, is we can change and manipulate different protocols of what we're doing to create different days. So I can go and create a red training load day, but still only have volume, uh, moderate volume, but our intensity is going to be through the roof. Same thing if we want to create a red uh, training load day, or sorry, a green training load day. We can still go high volume, we can still go red, but that intensity is just going to have to be super, super low. Okay, so again, depending on what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's a, a teaching day from more of a system standpoint, we're probably going to be in the training load area of about a yellow day, if that's what we're looking for. Our volume is going to be high because we're going to be on the ice probably for an hour, hour and a half, depending on what we're doing, how we're, how we're teaching it. But our intensity is not going to be very high. Lots of breaks, lots of teaching points, lots of walkthroughs. And that's kind of how we'll look at it. And then from a weekly standpoint, this is how we now program over the course of a week. Our coaching staff will meet at the beginning of the year, kind of go through, hey, this is what our goal is. But as we spoke about, hockey's volatile. A season's volatile. You go through slumps, you go through where you look like, holy man, are we doing the right thing? Or we go through peaks where we're unstoppable and we're like, man, <laughs> we got this under control. And so when we program, we'll meet every Monday and we'll take a look and say, okay, you know what? This week's a, uh, a green week. We have to be under 1,000 total. We know our game accounts for this much. So how are we going to program the rest of our week? And that's when we get into something like this. We look at training competition, okay? We have a plan going in. We know it's a yellow week, so we know in our yellow week, we go back here, 1,000 to 1,200. Okay, 1,000 to 1,200, we look on our tr weekly training load number, 1145. We've accomplished that, okay? We are where we want to be. This is a tentative plan for one of our players. Training competition, Monday, we're looking at, we're lifting, Tuesday, we're bringing our yoga instructor in. Wednesday, we're lifting. Thursday, we're bringing her back in. Friday, we're going to hit the pool in the morning after our morning skate. Saturday, Sunday, we have our games. Okay? We go down to our bottom. We look at our training load numbers. Okay? In terms of what we're actually physically looking for, in terms of practice, those are practice numbers. Okay? Now down below. Monday, we know we have about 80. Okay? A training load percentage of about 80. Tuesday is our battle day. We're looking at about 200, but everything goes off our game loads. Okay, so this, for this individual, their average game load typically is about 350. So he's a first line center. 
Okay, 350 is pretty high. Okay, he's working, he's working. So we know on Tuesday, because we can't fit whatever it is, 27 to 28 shifts, and that type of intensity over a three hour duration of what a game typically is in terms of pregame, intermissions, everything else like that, into a Tuesday practice. We couldn't load him at to 350 because we know we go back to our time above 90, we accomplish that. Okay, we accomplish that within that phase, and that's just what the training load now value is. So that's what we incorporate into it. Uh, Thursday, we know it's a green day. We have to really tailor back. We can still be above 90% for 4%, okay, 4% of the time. Training load minutes, okay, it's only 40 minutes long. That's why. Again, we come down to the bottom. We look at our intensity, which we can vary and our volume, which we can vary, all based upon our goals and what we're trying to accomplish. So we basically have one of these for each of our players. And you're like, well, man, how do you take care of that in game and in practice and trying to balance everything out? Well, I'm glad that we asked, because now we come to our drill book. And what happens is we have a drill book with every single drill that we do, okay? Every drill that we've ever programmed. At the beginning of every practice, we've got a drill sheet, basically has everything logged out to the minute of what's gonna occur and we have it named, okay? So from this, I've now taken certain parameters. The, the, the parameters we're able to look at, there's about 30 different numbers we can look at. Stress on the left leg, stress on the right leg. Um, but again, if we're not collecting and utilizing the data in helping us make decisions, then I don't need to look at 35 different vectors, different um, variables that are gonna affect what we're doing. I just need to look at maybe three or four that really I make all my decisions based off. So if we're taking a look here at our, um, let's take a look at the, uh, let's go power play in zone. Okay, so our power play in zone is done for 11 and a half minutes, okay, approximately. Our guys are averaging about 3.8% of the time, or sorry, 3.8 minutes, just round that out so it's about 350, three minutes and 50 seconds in uh, above 80, a minute and 10 seconds above 90. And then we create what's called yards per minute. So the reason we look at that is because you can be going up and down the ice covering a large distance. But again, depending on the speed that we're moving, depending on how fast we're going, depending on whether there's a back checker on us, it's, it's gonna, there's gonna be a variable there, something we have to look at our speed zones, and then our acceleration numbers. And that acceleration number is something that's important because acceleration creates that central fatigue, okay? That's that power output. That's that quick, quick, quick movement. That's that battle in the corner. That's that collisions. And again, we can break the accelerations down even further into different acceleration zones, whether it's above 2.8 meters per second or positive or negative 2.8 meters per second, 1.5. And what I found is if it's 1.5 meters per second, positive or negative, that's high speed skating. Anytime we're above 2.2, now we're getting into a little bit uh, more of the body contacts in the corners, a little bit more of the battles. And the way I was able to figure that out, again, just by knowing and uh, being able to validate it, was by putting our live data up against our videos, okay? Up against our video, basically timing it, heading the start, and basically looking when each marker was made and what was going on. And that's what we were able to find out. So we take a look here, and now we have a stress value. And this is really the only number that matters in terms of programming. Because we look at that stress value, and we're like, okay, obviously our three on three, or three by three low, five on five rush, third puck in the neutral zone, is much more stressful on our guys than say our neutral zone progression. Okay, makes sense. Three on three rush, okay, that last one, we're looking at our last drill on a Tuesday which is our big battle day, versus our neutral zone progression, which is typically a warm-up warm -up drill on a, two, on a Wednesday or a Thursday. So now that we find our drill book, now we take a look, okay, our forwards, our defense, and our goaltenders, all utilizing this same drill book, let's go to our three by three, regroup, regroup, attack drill. Okay, a track back on a five on two. Well, that stress value at the very end is 0.33 for our D-men, or sorry, 0.33 for our forwards, versus 0.73 for our D-men, 
and 0.23 for our goaltenders. Okay, perfect. It's great. Let's just use this for an example. If we were to go into a three-on-three -three cross ice drill, well, now our three-on-three -three cross ice is 0.59 for our D-men, 0.65 for our uh, point, sorry, uh, 0.59 for our uh, forwards, 0.65 for our D-men, and 0.49 for our goalies. Well, if we continued on this tra on this uh, on this pattern, all of a sudden, if we threw in four puck forwards around net as our next drill. 0.21 for our forwards, 0.52 for our D-men. Well, by this point of practice, our, our D-men are shot. We're no longer clearing pucks properly. We're no longer getting to pucks quickly. We're no longer attacking our forwards in the corner. Coaches are throwing shit. We don't know what's going on. We're all upset now. We're getting on the line. We're skating back and forth. And all, we're like, oh my God, we're going into the weekend. We're screwed. We're done. We're done. I don't know what's happening. We have no confidence left in our players. We've totally just bagged our guys to no fault of their own. And our goalies are like, well, I mean, that was a good day, I guess. <laughs> so again, having a plan, having a reason as to why we do things. And being able to say, OK, you know what? If we're going to go three on three, regroup, regroup, attack, five on two, we're going to have to find something that gets our forwards moving, but is a little backed off on our D-men. So two on one, uh, breakout coach dumps behind the net, you know what? Let's go with that guy because we're going to go 0.81 where our forwards or where our D-men are going to be a little bit lower and our goalies, that's a little stressful on them as well. So now we find... Sorry, is yeah. that stress value it related to that time value only? So what if you do another drill for a lesser period of time? Uh, it's, it's basically averaged out. So this is the entire season. So I've got it accumulated. So it'll continue to add up. And then it's a, uh, a, a ratio based upon uh, the yearly values. So these will continually be updated as we do drills. And so now we're able to look at it and say, OK, this is how we program our practices. He'll come into me on Monday and say, Justin, I want to do this Monday, this Tuesday, this Wednesday, this Thursday. How do we put the puzzle pieces together? So Monday, I want it to be a skill day. We're going to do a big, big teaching day. How can I get the load on these guys that we need Monday based upon what we're doing. And we'll sit down, I'll come to him with about a drill, maybe 20 or 30 different drills. He'll go, you know what, yes, this is exactly what I want to accomplish here. This is what I want to accomplish here. These are the time frames that we're going to do them for. At the end of the practice, we can look at our data again and say, okay, you know what? Our load for our guys, our D-men, we're about 150. That's where we needed them. Our forwards, about 160, perfect. Our goalies, about 145. Awesome, we're all in that range. Versus having guys at 230, 110, 300, we're able to look at it and have a little bit better idea that we're getting the loading parameters that we need out of our guys. Now, how do we sell it to our, our, our players? What information do we give them? Well, this is our number one D-man. Okay? We give them the daily averages, just kind of some information as to why we're doing things. Our weekly totals. Okay? So that weekly total is based before our games on the weekend. And then we give game breakdowns. So if I'm trying to sell a guy, you know what, nutritionally, you're really not where we need you to be. Okay? We need you to really start focusing on this recovery a little bit more. We need to focus on eating a little bit better, hydrating a little bit better, coming in for a little bit more of our regen sessions, really focusing, doing a little bit more outside of what we do as a team realm. He's like, well, why? Why do I have to do that? I feel really good. Well, this is a bad example of a guy, but say, in the third period, he's getting stronger. Um, he's continuing to, to maintain what we need him to. But maybe some of our lesser D-men, guys that are in and out of the lineup, well, we look at their acceleration numbers over the course of a game, they go from 10 to 6 to 2. Or their time of 90 goes from 3 to 2 to not even hitting it, another fatigue um, indicator. But the reason I show you this is because you look at the different parameters that are there, and when we're watching the game, we really have to take it into consideration. Because it doesn't logically make sense that over the course of a game, he's getting more and more, uh, he's getting more and more accelerations, almost double in the third period. Well, in the third period in this game, we uh, were shorthanded for five times. He was out there for five, five of those, uh, five of those kills. Every five one, or every kill, he was out there. It makes sense that we'd have a higher acceleration number. Reason being, he was put in more positions to do so. Um, 
The same thing was, uh, was in the next game, okay? The third period, got into some penalty trouble. Uh, same type of deal. You look at a game when you're in control, and you're like, well, you're fatiguing out. Why is that? Well, no, you're not fatiguing out. Simply, you didn't play as many minutes in the third period. That's all it is. So that's why, when I said we break it down to yards per shift, time over 90 per shift, that really, the accelerations per shift, that becomes important because you take a look at the numbers over the course of a game, and that's really what's going to end up facilitating a lot of that. So now how do we look at our in-season programming off of ice? How do we take that into consideration? Well, now we know that from a coaching standpoint, we've really taken care of that on-ice portion. Okay, we've really looked at it and said, this is what we need to do. We're doing it the best of our abilities, trying to put all the pieces in place. And now when we get into the weight room, we can utilize velocity-based training. We can utilize um, different individual screening techniques, like uh, Coach Shaw told us before, and really focus on that individual. Again, working with uh, one team, you have these advantages that you can kind of bring guys in and do different things with. But that's how we're able to utilize it. So now we're able to look at, again, those signs of fatigue in certain guys. Every morning, they'll come in. They'll do a player survey. They'll weigh in. They'll do a hydration test for us. We'll look at our change in resting heart rate, and we'll look at heart rate variability, okay? So we see that, and again, just one little piece of the pie, okay? If all of a sudden we have a change in resting heart rate, we don't start throwing red flags and go, oh, oh, hold on. Because again, they're athletes. You need to give them enough information that they need so that they can maintain the confidence, but enough so that we can create change. Lack of ability to hit 90% on high intense days. Okay, so if we know that our guys are getting bagged like on a Tuesday, and we have guys continually not being able to make 90%, 90%, 90%, we know there's potentially something going on with them. But by that time, there's probably a change in his resting heart rate. His heart rate variability is probably a little different. There's, his jump numbers are probably lower. So there, there's gonna be, again, different pieces of the puzzle that are ultimately gonna mesh all together and create this, this idea for us. Drastic heart rate or drastic change in heart rate response for the same drill on a different day. Again, going back to what Coach B talked about was how do you calculate that? Well, the reason we go over the course of the entire year is because if all of a sudden there's a drastic change in response for the same drill on a different day, why is that? Did you get more reps this day? Did you get fewer reps this day? A great example of this is when guys come back from Christmas break or when guys come back from Thanksgiving, although it's only three or four days off, that first day back, our loads way more than predicted, way more. Why? Well, most guys might not have done anything over three days, and that turkey's sitting a little heavy, okay? Total training load drop off of 15%. Now, I'm talking about a game here, okay? There's gonna be a little bit drop off from Friday versus Saturday, okay? Obviously, there's a little bit of fatigue left up in that, but if we have a drop off of 15%, from Friday to Saturday, again, maybe we didn't peak that guy properly or didn't do everything that we could have potentially done for that guy leading up to Friday, Saturday. A little bit too much drop off there. Or you can take a look at the game. Maybe he had to, maybe D-Man had to play 35 minutes on Friday. It's gonna affect him for Saturday a little bit. Okay, how do we minimize that? Drop off in the total number of accelerations, greater than 10%. Again, again, based off our game or based off our period. Okay, again, another thing. So we have to look at it in small, Small forms. We can't take a huge big picture and start making conclusions. We have to really dive into it a little bit and say, okay, how is this, uh, how is this going? I'll kind of touch on this a little bit as well. Um, my uh, graduate assistant who helped me with this, um, his thesis was um, based off off-ice testing parameters, correlating them to on-ice testing data. And what we were able to find and validate is certain testing protocols when guys are coming in to give us a starting value of training load, of percent above 90, and of acceleration number. And so we have an idea going in of where guys should be. So we're not going in blind and just saying, here, boom, go. So, we, so we're able to find kind of arbitrary uh, starting numbers that then we can peak and twist throughout. And then obviously, like I spoke about, distance per shift, accelerations per shift, distance per time on ice, and then percent of time in each heart rate zone, uh, again, will give us that indication of fatigue and what we need to do to ultimately figure out how we can better train each athlete. 
So kind of with that, um, I'll open it up for questions here in a sec, but I want to thank the NSTA, obviously Miami, uh, for uh, allowing me to do a lot of this, and then uh, Ship Performance for a uh, little company that I've got down in Miami, Florida, that uh, we're able to do a lot of these studies with and come up with a lot of this stuff. So 